quite windy here. Um, it's tied down well, though. I think uh, it's, it's, this is, uh, <laughs> oh, actually, wasn't expecting it to be this windy. Hopefully, you can actually hear what I'm saying. <laughs> um, you, okay, great, great. Um, so, uh, this, is, this is, I think, the, the most inspiring thing that I've ever seen. Um, and I'd just like to uh, thank the, the, the SpaceX team and the, the suppliers and um, the, the, the people of, uh, of, of Boca Chica and Brownsville. Uh, thank you for your support and uh, just like, wow, what an incredible job um, by a, a, such a great team to build this incredible vehicle. Uh, so I was like, well, first of all, I want to start with that. Uh, so. I'm just so so so, pr so proud to work with such a great team, um, and uh, <laughs> it's really ripping here. By the way, if you're watching this online, <laughs> it is like uh, it is really windy. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the the point of this uh, this presentation and this this event is really uh, there, there, there are two elements to it. One is to uh, in inspire the public, um, get people excited about. Uh, our future in space, and um, and get people fired up about the future. The you know what what um, th there are so many things to worry about, so many things to be concerned about. Um, there's there are many troubles in the world, of course, and we th these are important, and we need to solve them. But we also need things that make us ex excited to be alive, that make us glad to wake up in the morning, um, and be fired up about the future, and, and think, yeah, the future is going to be great. You know, and, and this space exploration is one of those things. Um, and becoming a, a space-faring civilization, being out there among the stars, this is one of the things that I, I know makes, makes me glad to be alive. I think it makes many people glad to be alive. It's one of the best things. And there's, there's really, we're, we're, we're faced with a choice. Which future do you want? Do you want the future where we become a space-faring civilization and are in many worlds? and out there among the stars, or one where we are forever confined to Earth. And I say it is the first. And, and, and I hope you agree with me. Yeah. Hmm. So, so what, the, question, the, the, the critical breakthrough that's needed for us to become a space-bearing civilization is to make space travel like air travel. So, uh, with, with air travel, you could, you, when, you, when you fly a plane, um, you, you, you fly that plane many times. I mean, the risk of stating the obvious, it really almost any mode of transport, whether it's a plane, a car, a horse, a bicycle, is reusable. You use that mode of transport many times. And if you had to get a new plane every time you flew somewhere, and even get, have two planes for a return journey, very few people could afford to fly. Or if you could use a car only once, very few people could afford to drive a car. So the, the critical breakthrough that's necessary is a rapidly reusable orbital rocket. This is, a, this is basically the holy grail of, of uh, space um, and the, the fundamental thing that's, that's required. And it's, it is a very hard thing to do. It's only barely possible with, with the physics of, uh, of Earth. I mean, if, if, gravity, if Earth's gravity was a little heavier, it would be, it would be impossible. Um, and if Earth's gravity was a little lighter, it would be quite easy. Um, so, we're really right on the cusp of what is physically possible. So, in, in order to create a rapidly reusable uh, rocket, a fully reusable orbital rocket, you have to have engines that are, ha have incredibly uh, high specific impulse, that, have, that essentially are extremely efficient. You need to have a structure that is also incredibly mass efficient. Um, and, and, and then that all needs to come back to the launch pad and be able to be uh, refilled with propellant and flown again very quickly, just like an aircraft. So it, it's, just, it's just because of the physics of, of, of Earth being, having, being quite a, a deep gravity well and having quite a thick atmosphere, this is, this is, a, a, very, this is a, a tough but not impossible thing. But it is the most fundamental thing. So with, with SpaceX, you know, we, um, we, we started out uh, 17 years ago, and uh, the, the first rocket we designed was the, the, the Falcon 1, which was that guy right there. Three, so, two, yeah. one. 
Stage separation. Stage separation confirmed. So, so Falcon One, we thought, yeah, uh, good old Falcon One. Um, I mean, we, we started off, we were very naive. In, in fact, the, the reason, I should say, the reason it's September 28th was, September, this is the 11th anniversary of the first time SpaceX uh, reached orbit. So 11 years ago today, SpaceX made orbit for the first time. Um, and it, it, it was actually our, it was our fourth launch. And if, we, if that launch had not succeeded, SpaceX, that would have been the end of SpaceX. That was all, I, I'd run out of money. There were no, there were no more investors. Um, and, and that would have been it. So if, if that fourth launch had not succeeded, that would have been curtains. But fortunately, fate smiled on us that day. And, and we, we made it to orbit. And I have great respect for anyone who makes it to orbit. That was a hard thing. Um, <laughs> um, and, and then we were very naive, obviously very naive on, naive on, on, on many levels uh, back, back then, because we, we, we did actually try to recover the first stage. So the first stage had a, a parachute on it. And, and we thought, OK, we'll just pop the parachute um, when it comes back into the atmosphere. And then it'll land somewhere in the ocean. We'll go fish it out of the ocean with a boat. Um, this is not, this does not work. Um, so, and I actually remember getting mad at the parachute supplier. I'm like, yeah, your parachute didn't work. I'm like, no, it wasn't their fault. Um, when the rocket comes in fr fr from, uh, from space, um, it's coming in, the, that first stage is coming in like, you know, M Mach 10 to 12, and it, it hits the atmosphere like it's a concrete wall, and boom. <laughs> so, um, you actually have to, orient the rocket carefully, you have to have uh, aerodynamic surfaces, you have to do um, an entry burn to slow it down, you got, you got, then you, you've got to guide it through the atmosphere, um, and then uh, do a propulsive landing. Uh, this took us many, uh, many attempts. Um, and we actually uh, did like a video of all, a blooper reel of all the times we failed, which was a lot. I think it might have taken us like 14 attempts or something before we finally successfully landed the rocket. So, um, so we, if, we, if we go on to the next uh, slide, we can take a look at, uh, th this is Grasshopper. This is the, this, that's actually Falcon 9. Um, it's hard to tell the scale, but that's, that's a Falcon 9 size uh, booster with one engine and, and uh, big legs with giant shock absorbers. Because we didn't know what, what the heck we were doing. Um, now amazingly, Grasshopper had zero, zero, zero crashes. Grasshopper is still alive. are confused. Yeah. So, so the um, th that was a, so, so they have Falcon 1, what you saw there was a Falcon 9 size vehicle. And, and then what, what's really kind of hard to grasp um, at, at, a, at a visceral level is that this giant ship will do the same thing that Grasshopper did. So this, this thing is going to take off, uh, fly to 65,000 feet, about 20 kilometers, and come back and land um, in, in about uh, one to two months. So that giant thing is really going to be pretty epic to see that thing take off and come back. Um, and then hopefully, yeah. Yeah, it's wild. Um, it's, it, so now I, I, there, there's, this is a quite radical, I'll, I'll talk about it later in the presentation. This is, this is a quite, quite a new approach to controlling, um, controlling a rocket, um, much more akin to a skydiver than a plane. Uh, but I'll talk about that later. So um, going from 
uh, from Falcon 1 to Falcon 9 to Falcon Heavy, which we launched, actually the first launch of Falcon Heavy was only uh, February of last year. So it's only been about a year and a half since the first Falcon Heavy launch when we did two side-by-side -side booster landings. Um, and I always like this, this video that was uh, done by my friend Jonah. Yeah, I never thought that would happen, actually. Um, glad that it did. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny, like, the, 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 you know, some people wonder, like, why, why, why do we have the roadster with the astronaut, you know, Starman? And it was, actually just came from a discussion of my friend Jonas, I was at his, in his kitchen, and I was like, you know, normally when they do a rocket launch, they launch a rocket concrete, but that sounds, doesn't sound very inspiring, so, what do you think the most? Is, what do you think the most sort of fun thing is that we could launch? And he was like, "Well, why don't you just launch a Tesla?" And um, that, that's a great idea. Um, and there's a yeah. And then another friend went. She said, uh, "Why don't you put a tiny Tesla on the dashboard?" So we put a tiny Tesla on the dashboard with a tiny star man in the tiny Tesla. <laughs> um, this is just to confuse the aliens in the future. <laughs> they were like, "What the heck is this?" <laughs> So, yeah, uh, you know, just want something to capture the imagination, get people excited about space. Um, so let's see, Starship. Um, so this is, uh, as you, well, you can really see it right there, obviously. Uh, there's the picture, more rendering. It's um, about 150, about, about 50 meters, so, um, you know, sort of 165 feet or so. Um, and, uh, yeah, so the, the ship, I think, <laughs> actually, I noticed we have an error in our ship dry mass here. My apologies. <laughs> I, I, I wish it was uh, 85 tons. <laughs> the sh ship dry mass would be approximately 120 tons. Um, this, the, the, the initial Mark I prototype is, is closer to 200 tons, and the, in series production, um, I think it'll probably be about 120 tons. Uh, if we get really lucky, it might get down to 110. 99 would be super epic. Um, so, uh, but, but in, in terms of its, of its usefulness, it'll be, be able to do about 150 tons with full reusability uh, to orbit and back. So this is, this is a very you know, big number for full reusability. Um, the, the, ver the very initial versions we're confident will do over 100 tons, but I think we, there's a clear path to uh, 150 tons. Um, and 
the, 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 the cost of, of, of a fully reusable system is basically the cost of the propellant, which is mostly oxygen. Um, this is th uh, three and a half tons of, oxy of oxygen for every one ton of fuel. So one of the advantages of, of, the, of, of this architecture uh, over the Falcon architecture is that we actually use more oxygen uh, per, per unit of fuel rather than, than less. So um, um, Merlin or the, the, the the Falcon architecture is about two and a half tons of oxygen for every one ton of fuel. This is three and a half tons of oxygen for every one ton of fuel. So when this ascends, it, it's really mostly liquid oxygen. Um, because when you get to vacuum, there's no air, basically. Um, so, yeah. Um, the next slide. So, yeah. So the, um, earlier I was talking about how Starship uh, enters and how it's controlled, um, it's, it's really qu it's quite different from anything else. It's really um, falling. And so we're doing a controlled fall. So with, with a rocket, you're actually trying to break um, as opposed to you're trying to create drag instead of lift. It's, it's really the opposite of an aircraft. You want the most amount of drag that you can produce. Um, and you want some lift, especially when you're in the upper atmosphere, mostly so that you, don't, you can control the maximum heating rate. Um, you want enough lift to keep yourself high in the, the low density portion of the atmosphere so you can, you can, you can burn off velocity. And, and then, uh, so you want, and, 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 but, the, but then, you know, basically it goes like, if, if, this, is the, if this is the Earth, it goes, it goes at about a 60 degree, <laughs> my hand is the rocket, <laughs> it, it's, it's going at about 60 degrees. Um, so when, when in orbit, you're, you're actually going at around 25 times the speed of sound, horizontal to the ground. So this is a, a very important concept that is counterintuitive to our normal daily life. Um, being in orbit, being in zero G, is not about altitude. It's about velocity. How fast are you going um, ho uh, horizontally? <laughs> this doesn't. Um, so when, when something's in orbit, it's zooming around the Earth so fast that the outward acceleration, outward radial acceleration, is in, equal to the inward acceleration of gravity and then you have zero gravity. This is why you actually have zero gravity. The space station, people often think the space station is stationary, but it's actually going around the world at 25 times the speed of sound, or about 17,000 miles an hour. It, look, it, it always looks stationary in the pictures. Um, and since there's no air, you don't have to have a, um, an aerodynamic structure. So you can be a totally crazy structure that, that doesn't look like it should be able to go 25 times the speed of sound, but it does. Um, and you can only feel acceleration. You can't feel velocity. So people sometimes like to wonder, what does it feel like to go 25 times the speed of sound? Actually, it feels like nothing. Um, only accelerating to there feels like something. So, so, the, so, the, so Starship is coming in. This, is the, if this, this platform is the Earth. It's coming in at, at hypersonic velocity like this, sort of at, at around a 60 degree angle. So it comes like this, and then starts falling, and then just falls like a skydiver. And it's just controlling itself, and then it, it turns and lands like that. So, <laughs> that, <laughs> that's incredibly elaborate explanation. Um, and then you can get a sense for it. This is much better. <laughs> there you go. See? Same thing. <laughs> Look better with the hand? Okay. <laughs> But it'll look totally nuts to see that thing land. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that'd be crazy. Wow. Um, so, uh, cool. So let's see. Talking about uh, the, the Raptor engine. Um, so there's, 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 the ship will have a total of six engines, uh, three um, of the sea level variety of, of Raptor. And those are actually on the rocket right now. So we have the three sea level. In fact, that's a picture of, of just inside that skirt, that's what it looks like. So we've got the th three um, sea level Raptor engines, and they, they gimbal, which, is, which means that the whole engine moves. So the way a rocket uh, steers is by moving the entire engine. So whereas an aircraft engine is static, and you, you move by moving like the control surfaces, like the aer uh, aer ailerons and rudder and elevator and flaps, this, um, in this, the rocket, when the, when the engines are powered, um, you move the entire engine to steer it. But so. 
St the Starship will have three uh, sea level uh, engines that move up to about 15 degrees uh, angle and three vacuum engines that are optimized for efficiency that will, be, um, that will not move. So they will be just fixed in place. Um, and that allows us to have the biggest bell nozzle for the, uh, for the, rap for, for the, for the vacuum Raptor engines. Um, and uh, the, aspirationally, the, the target is a, a 380 second ISP for the vacuum engine. This is a very, in, in, in sort of space geek terms, this is like a really a great number. Um, and, and, and even for the, the steel oil engines to get over uh, th uh, a, a, a 350 second uh, ISP is also uh, really great. So, oh, actually, yeah, sorry. I'm looking at the slide, you're not. So that's what I meant by it looks like that on the inside. Sorry, go back one slide. That's the, that's the inside of the Starship right now. So that's what it looks like in the base. All right, uh, and then heat shield. So um, we have we've gone through various iterations of heat shield. There's a lot of ways to, to uh, skin the cat here. Uh, the, ultimately, we decided to have uh, heat shield um, hexagonal tiles, uh, ceramic tiles that um, are, are basically are like a tiny glass vermicelli um, at a microstructure level. Um, but they're, so they're very, very light, but, but, but very um, crack resistant, uh, essentially glass tiles. Um, and they're, it, because, because Starship is, an, is an, a steel construction. Like, it, like at first, it feels like, oh, it's steel. Does that mean it's heavy? No, actually, it's the lightest construction. This is, steel is the best thing, is the, I think the best thing about, best design decision on, on this whole thing is a 301 stainless steel. Um, because at cryogenic temperatures, a 301 stainless actually has about the same effective strength as an advanced composite or aluminum lithium. Unlike most steels, which get brittle at low temperature, um, a 301 stainless gets much stronger. And if it's in the, in, the, in, the, in the extra hard condition, meaning it's cold rolled to extra hard condition, it also gets way stronger. So it gets, it's actually gets, it, it's, it, it's strength to weight ratio um, at, at cryogenic temperatures is, is equivalent or even perhaps slightly better than, than um, advanced composites or aluminum lithium. So this is, this is not well appreciated, because if you just look at the materials manual and say, like, what, what is the strength of, of stainless steel, it, 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 it looks much weaker than it is. You say, what is the strength at cryogenic temperature? Oh, much, much stronger, or, you know, at very low temperature, almost twice as strong. Um, that's when it becomes better than, than carbon fiber or, or, or aluminum lithium. And there's another benefit. It also has a high melting temperature. So for a reusable ship, you're coming in like a meteor. You want something that does not melt at a low temperature. You want something that melts at a high temperature. Um, and this is where steel is extremely good as well. Um, so it's, you know, steel ha has a melting temperature um, around sort of 1,500 degrees centigrade, uh, whereas uh, aluminum, you, you know, maybe 300 or 400 degrees. Um, and same thing for carbon fiber, and that's really pushing it, you know. You, you, so th this is ha having that much higher melting temperature means that you don't need any shielding on the, the leeward side of the, of the ship when it comes in for entry. And, and the shielding you need on the windward side, the hot side, is, is massively reduced because the, the, the thickness of the tile uh, is, is actually, for a reusable system, is dependent on what back shell temperature like, how hot does the back of the tile that interfaces with the airframe get? And because the steel can take a much higher temperature, your, your heat shield, even on the windward side, is much, is much lighter. The, the net effect is that a, a, a 301 stainless steel rocket is actually the lightest possible reusable architecture. Then, then it comes come to cost. The, the carbon fiber we were using was $130 a ton. The steel is $2,500 a ton. Oh, sorry, sorry, two, two, sorry. Yeah, 25, it's, the, the, uh, the, sorry, the $130,000 a ton versus $2,500 a ton. That makes much more sense. So it was, 
It's $130,000 a ton for the carbon fiber and $2,500 a ton for the steel. So the steel is about 2% of the cost of the carbon fiber. So this is a good thing we changed from carbon fiber to steel, uh, by far. Uh, <laughs> it was, and and the, it's very easy to weld stainless steel. The, the evidence being that we welded it outdoors without a factory. So, yeah, yeah. Great skills by the team, but with, with carbon fiber, this is impossible. With uh, aluminum lithium, also impossible. Uh, but steel is, very, is, is, is easy to weld and it is resilient to the elements. Um, and also, uh, actually, uh, as, as uh, talking with Austin earlier, he was saying, like, on, on Mars, you, you can like, cut that up, you can weld it, you can modify it, no problem. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. You're, you're in, out there on the moon or Mars, you, you want something that you can modify, that you can cut up and use for other things. That's like, for sure, a great thing. So anyway, steel, I, obviously, I'm in love with steel. It's, uh, you know, it's time, I, yeah, I yeah, had to say it, you know. So, great, so let's see. Uh, going on to the booster. So the, the booster is designed to take up to 37 Raptor engines. I'm not sure if we'll go that high, but you can really, um, you know, have uh, 31. I think like the minimum number you'd want is, you know, maybe around 24. Um, but the, the booster is is designed to be able to take uh, multiple engines out. So you can actually add or subtract engines as you'd like. You basically just need a lot of force pushing up. Um, over time, I think the pro you probably want around a 7,500. Uh, ton force uh, rocket, um, which is about twice the thrust of a Saturn V, a little more than twice the th thrust, um, and, uh, and, and on, on a roughly 5,000 ton uh, lift, lift off, gross liftoff mass. Uh, so for roughly one and a half uh, thrust to weight. Um, for a reusable rocket, you actually want a high thrust to weight rather than uh, it, with a, an expendable rocket where you want a low thrust to weight. Um, because any thrust weight below one is not useful. Like if you, if, you, if you have less thrust than your weight, you don't move. Um, so you actually want a high thrust to weight for a reusable rocket. This is a, a very important um, design optimization change. Um, so, so that's why I think you know, more engines are probably good um, and, and getting up to around 7,500 tons uh, over time uh, and a one and a half, to, one, one and a half thrust to weight ratio uh, or more. So, and, and we're we think we're probably going to adjust the grid fin design to be kind of like a, more of like a diamond shape. Um, it looks cooler. Uh, it works better, too. And then the, the rear fins are actually just legs. So they're not, um, they're not need, needed for stabilization or guidance. They're, they're essentially uh, there for, for legs. All right, so some, let's go into some of the development testing. This is a Raptor firing. All right, and then uh, obviously we, we had a Raptor fire on uh, the Starhopper. Uh, yeah. Um, it, and it's, it's, it's kind of hard to, see, to appreciate scale, but it's the same diameter as the uh, Starship. And obviously it's just right over there. So 
it, it's kind of hard to tell if it's the size of a trash can or uh, the, you know how big it is. But it's it's a that, it's about, the the body diameter is about 30, nine meters or thirty feet, not including the leg span. <laughs> so this, <laughs> this gives you a sense of, of size. Um, so the little pixels there, that's a, little, little pixels are a human. Um, and then there's the hopper next to it, the Millennium Falcon for comparison. Um, then Starship, which is what you see before you. And then that's what it look, will look like with the full stack, which is almost two and a half times as tall as this vehicle. This simulation will give you a sense of the, the scale of things. It slightly reminds me of the scene from Spaceballs. So, yeah, so there, a rapidly reusable orbital launcher or rocket is, it says a rapidly reusable rocket is required for <laughs> alliteration, um, for, um, achieve, for, for getting a breakthrough in, in cost of access to space, that you don't throw the rockets away every, every flight. 
But an, another key step is refilling on orbit so that uh, the Starship can get to orbit with, let's say, 150 tons of, of payload for the moon or Mars or beyond. Um, and then uh, it can get tankered to fill up its propellant tanks and so that it, it can depart from low Earth orbit with 1,200 tons of propellant. This is a very big thing so that your, um, your delta velocity is, is enough to transport 150, literally 150 tons to the surface of the moon or Mars. Um, with, with full reusability and orbital refilling, um, which is, is essentially that orbital refilling is actually a simplified version of what SpaceX does in, in, in docking with the space station. So it's actually harder to dock with the space station than it is to do orbital refilling. But in practicing in docking with the space station, um, SpaceX has, has also learned how to rendezvous and dock in orbit um, in, in a complex environment. So this is one of the other critical pieces of the puzzle. Um, needed, needed to establish a base on the moon and Mars, a, a city, ultimately. Um, and, yeah, so those, those are the critical ingredients. So we, we think it would be very exciting to have a base on the moon, um, e even if it's just a science base um, that, you know, we have, for example, we have a base uh, at, at Antarctica. Many, many countries have bases in Antarctica for science research. And this would be an incredible area of research. Um, so whether or not people want to live on the moon, there's definitely a lot of science to be done. Um, and uh, I think this is close as well. Um, so that's, that would be quite exciting to do. And then, of course, uh, we can go other, to other places in the solar system, like Saturn. Uh, and, uh, but the, the critical thing that we need to focus on, I think, is the fastest path to a self-sustaining city on Mars. This is the, this is the fundamental thing. Yes. You know, as, as far as we know, as far as we know, we are the only consciousness or the only life that's out there. There might be other life, but we've seen no signs of it. And you know, people often ask me, if you, what, do you, what do you know about the aliens and that? And I'm like, man, I tell you, if I'm pretty sure I'd know. You know, if there were aliens. I have not seen any sign of aliens. Um, and uh, so like, well, is the military hiding aliens in Area 51 or something, you know? Um, that's a popular meme. Um, it, it, well, let me tell you, it, the, the biggest, the fastest way to increase defense funding would be to bring out, like, hey, we found an alien. People are like, ah, more money for defense, definitely. <laughs> this is guaranteed. They would try to, that would be like on display in two seconds. So, um, yeah, so, so the, 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 the reality is, as far as we know, uh, this is the only place, at least in this part of the galaxy or in the, in the Milky Way, where there is consciousness. And it's taken a long time for us to get to this point. You know, according to the, the geological records, Earth's been around for about four and a half billion years, although it's mostly molten magma for about a half a billion years. So, but still, several billion years with um, at least bacterial life and multicellular life for several hundred million years. Um, but, but here's the interesting part, like it, it, the, the, the sun is gradually getting hotter and bigger. And over time, uh, even in the absence of, of global warming, um, man-made stuff, the, the, the sun will um, expand and it will, it will overheat the earth. M my guess is probably this is on, 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 on human time scales, this is a long time, but it's, there's only, you know, several hundred million years left. That's all. That's all we got. Okay, several hundred million years. Um, but but, it, but th thought of in, if, from an uh, evolutionary standpoint, um, basically, if, if it took an extra 10% longer for conscious life to evolve on Earth, it wouldn't evolve at all because it would have been incinerated by the sun. So, so the, what I'm saying is that it, it's, it appears that consciousness is a very rare and precious thing. And we should take whatever steps we can to preserve the light of consciousness. And the window, the window has been open only now. After four and a half billion years is that window open. That's, that's a long time to wait. 
and it might not stay open for long. I, I'm pretty optimistic by nature, but there's some chance there's some chance that window will not be open for long. And I think we should become a multi-planet civilization while that window is open. And if we do, I think the probable outcome for Earth is even better, if, because then you know Mars could help Earth one day. You know, and so I think we should really do our very best to become a multi-planet species and to extend consciousness beyond Earth, and we should do it now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be commencing a Q&A session in just five minutes, so please hang, hang out and hang tight. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, please sit tight. We're going to be doing a Q&A session with Elon in just five minutes. Please stick around.
Oh yeah, uh, any questions? <laughs> so, yeah. Hi, hi Elon, Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, thank you for the overview. Um, can you tell us a little bit more details about the flight test program for this and the Mark II? Actually, can and we just talk, turn the music off? I can't quite hear because there's music playing. Oh, excellent. No, I'm sorry. Could you trouble you to say that again? Yes, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more details about the flight test program for both this Mark I and the Mark II vehicle in Florida and um, what the progression is to get to orbital flight and then a test flight or a commercial mission with the full vehicle? Uh, sure. Um, Thanks. So, yep. Um, with any uh, development into uncharted territory, it is difficult to predict these things with precision. But um, I do think things are going to move very fast. Um, so our plan is in, in basically one to two months to do the, the 20 kilometer or 65 foot flight um, with Starship Mark 1. Um, Our next flight after that might actually just be all the way to orbit with a booster and the ship. Um, most, th this is, I'm, I'm giving you just literally stream of consciousness here. Most likely, most likely we would not fly to orbit with Mach 1, but we would fly to orbit with Mach 3, which we built after Mach 1 right here. In fact, we'll start building it in about a month. So, yeah. Um, um, and, and actually, um, so, sorry to say this mid-question, but uh, I, I did want to make sure to uh, thank Yusaku Mizawa for his great support. Um, yeah, he's awesome. Uh, Yusak2020, that's his handle. That's a great handle. Um, anyway, he's a super cool dute, and he's like, you know, put, putting a lot of serious resources to helping out uh, Starship, so I want to thank him very much for that. Um, the... Uh, Anyway, so, yeah, just to frame things, we are going to be building ships and boosters at both Boca and the Cape as fast as we can. Um, and, and, and each successive, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's going to be really nutty to see a bunch of these things. I mean, not just one, but a whole stack of them. Um, and we're improving both the design and the manufacturing method um, exponentially. So, for example, um, with the current way that we built this, this or the way that Mach 1 and Mach 2 cylindrical sections were built uh, was in, um, w with basically plates. So a series of plates to create each cylinder section. With uh, Mach 3 and beyond, we will literally take the coil of steel from the mill, unspool it, uh, change the curvature to a nine meter diameter, and do a single seam weld. Um, and it would also be thinner, which makes it lighter and cheaper. Um, so th the, the rate at which we will be building ships is going to be quite, quite crazy by space standards. Um, I think we'll probably have Mark II built within a couple of months or, or less, and Mark III, maybe three months, that type of thing. Um, Mark IV, four months, maybe five months. And we would seek to go to orbit with probably Mark IV or Mark V. So we would, I mean, this is going to sound totally nuts, but I think we want to try to reach orbit in less than six months. Uh, I mean, pro provi provided the rate, the rate of, tech of design improvement and manufacturing improvement continues to be exponential, I think that is, uh, you know, accurate to within a few months. Hi, Elon. My name is Steve Clark. I'm with the Brownsville Herald. Okay. Back in September 2014 at the groundbreaking, you said that the first crewed interplanetary mission could possibly leave 
Yes. Can you hear me? Could possibly leave from Boca Chica. Do you think that's still the case? Yes, so that is, I think, definitely possible that the first uh, crewed mission on Starship could leave from uh, Boca. Um, the, we actually are, are internally competing um, the Cape, the Cape and, and Boca. Um, so I think, I think both, will, both places will, as, as to, to the best of my knowledge, both places will launch uh, crewed missions. Um, so I think it is extremely likely that we will launch crewed missions from Boca, um, and there is a, at least a 50% chance that it is the first mission. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hey, Elon, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Hey, How are you? How's it going? Good. Yeah. Good. You have great questions online. Thanks. You have yeah. great answers. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so uh, that belly flop to tail down maneuver, I yeah. mean, that's something to see. Is that first one, this one right here, you know, 20 kilometers, is it going to come in that hot and do that, that flip that fast yeah. right here? Or is it going to be out on the drone ship? Like, that's no, it's crazy. Gonna, it's basically right where Hopper took off. Yeah. That's basically where it's going to take off. You know, within, you know, very close to where, 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 it's just right over there, you know. Um, so yeah, it, it, that maneuver that you see, you saw, it will execute now. Um, with, you know, when we get to, I think maybe Mark 3, certainly Mark 4, I think probably the, the, that will be a good time to transition to um, hot, hot gas thrusters and from cold gas thrusters. So um, uh, using essentially uh, compressed nitrogen uh, gas as the cold gas thruster is a pretty low ISP, you know, sort of 60, 70 if you're very lucky, but very closer to 60. Um, with um, with a, a meth ox thruster, you can get, without really even trying hard, 300 ISP. Um, even if you just film cool the walls without even regen cooling. Um, if, you, if you regen cool it, 350, no problem, 360 even. So you're talking about something that's the, then uh, five or six times the uh, mass efficiency of the, the nitrogen thrusters that are in Mach 1. Um, and w if you have thrusters of, of, of that efficiency, then uh, we don't need to use, uh, um, use the Raptors to, to correct the uh, horizontal velocity. Because right, right now it's actually, uh, w w when, it, when the Raptors fire, the Raptors kick it, up, kick it over, but, but, but they they're actually accelerate the vehicle in the wrong direction then they have to overcorrect and then come back. Um, whereas if you have strong enough thrusters, you can just, uh, using the, the onboard um, maneuvering thrusters without lighting the main engines, you can just go kick it hard, light the engine, land. That'd be, you know, that's better. Yeah. yeah. And then the, are those pressure fed then, those? Yeah, 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 those be uh, uh, just pressure fed, high, pr high pressure uh, uh, gas methox, and so you'd have a high pressure, uh, um, you know, CH4 bottle, high pressure O2 bottle. Um, and then the great thing is like those, those um, don't, they don't care what attitude you're at. You can be at any attitude, any, you know, any G's, any attitude, it'll still fire. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Elon. I'm Tim Fernholz from Quartz. Thanks so much for taking the time. You're welcome. Two questions, if I may. One, just technical, following up on the presentation. To do useful stuff in orbit, you're going to need the booster as well as the Starship, right? Yes. Uh, Starship ca cannot get to uh, Earth orbit without the booster. Um, but um, anywhere except Earth, pretty much. Well, not counting Venus. But like the, the um, Mars or the Moon, uh, the ship, provided you have a propellant plant on Mars or Moon, the ship can easily get a single stage from the surface of the Moon all the way to, to, to the surface of Earth without a booster. Um, so it shows you how deep, like Earth has a deep gravity well and a thick atmosphere. Um, so, um, but, but definitely cannot, I mean, well, I mean, if we, if we really went crazy light, you could probably do single stage to orbit non-reusable with the ship. Um, but that would be pointless. Elon, I just wanted to ask, uh, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine had a tweet last night about this presentation, concerned I guess, about enthusiasm uh, for SpaceX's various programs. I'm just curious if you have any comment or response to that. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, for sure, the, uh, from a SpaceX resource standpoint, um, our, uh, our resources are overwhelmingly on Falcon and Dragon. Um, that is to be clear. The, it was really quite a, a small percentage of SpaceX that uh, did this, did, um, 
uh, Starship, you know. Um, less than 5% of the company, basically. Um, the, like, like the, the really hard part that requires a lot of resources is optimizing something past the initial prototype phase and bringing it into volume production. Um, so, t yeah, to be clear, like the vast majority of our resources are on Dragon and Falcon, especially Crew Dragon. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Elon. Uh, Chris Gebhardt with NASA Space Flight. Um, how, how do you guys um, envision keeping the methane and oxygen inside the tanks from boiling off in any significant quantity during a multi-month interplanetary trip to Mars? And um, on a more Earth-grounded question, what's your contamination mitigation strategy since these things are being built outside in the elements and not, not in a factory? Well, the, the, these are pretty far in the distance uh, uh, questions. These questions are relevant, but in the, in the future years. Um, the, keeping the, the, um, the landing propellants cold on the way to Mars is a lot easier than it may seem, um, because you can essentially vacuum, uh, just like you'd keep um, uh, pr pr uh, cryogenic propellants uh, stored on Earth for long periods of time, you're vacuum jacketed. Um, we would essentially, um, uh, have header tanks that are bigger than these header tanks um, uh, and, and, and vent them to, to vacuum. So you would just basically have a tank inside a tank with multi-layer insulation. Um, and, and this way you can keep the things cryogenic for months, no problem. Uh, it requires very little energy to, you don't even really need to worry about boil off. You could, you could, you could apply some energy to cryo cool it, uh, but you don't really need to, you'd have a tiny amount of boil off. Um, you know, in, in, in vacuum, things are, things are kind of weird. They're not like on Earth, because you have no uh, convective cooling, really, in zero G. Um, so you, you actually have, you, you, the, the sun side of your rocket is very hot, and the, the not sun side of your rocket is at three degrees Kelvin. So it's super cold. Um, so you just like keep your cold stuff on the cold side and the hot stuff on the hot side, and it's pretty, this is not a problem to manage. Um, you know, the, uh, for the, the long-term stuff for sort of what's called contamination of Mars, you know, the, the, I, I think this, this concern, first of all, we'll do everything we can to mitigate it, obviously. Um, and, but, but at the end of the day, if you're going to send people to Mars, that's a pretty big contaminant, you know. Um, but I, I really don't think that uh, some Earth-based bacterium is going to be able to migrate much through Mars. The, the thing that makes Mars very difficult is that it is both cold and has high ultraviolet. So if it was either cold or ultraviolet, you could evolve to deal with it. But the, the cold slows down the metabolic processes, and, the, and then the ultraviolet shreds the, shreds the DNA. So you're cold and shredded. Uh, this is very difficult for things to exist on the surface of Mars, and that's why we have not found uh, any traces of life on the surface of Mars uh, to date. If there is any life, it'll be very deep underground, and I think very resilient. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right. Um, it's, it's also worth noting that uh, over time, there have been um, meteors, there have been chunks of Earth that have been chipped off by meteors, uh, and chunks of Mars that have been chipped off from Mars. And Earth and Mars have actually exchanged material many times over, over the last several hundred million years. Hey, Elon, it's Chris Davenport from the Washington Post. Hey. Uh, curious about your vision for this area. I mean, when you drive by and you see this, it's surreal. This is uh, surreal. Yeah, and, but I know your vision isn't maybe like a government launch site, like a Cape Canaveral, but what does this look like, at, like a private, operational, commercial spaceport? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, um, I mean, it, it will definitely get fancier than it currently is, you know, because the, 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 the reason it's not fancier is, is, is just because it would have taken too long to build the buildings. So it, it, since it was going to take so long to build the buildings, we just built it outside. Um, yeah, it, this is like, um, my new thing is uh, management by rhyming. Uh, if the schedule's uh, long, it's wrong, and if it's tight, it's right. Yeah. <laughs> it works. I mean, SR-71, you know, fastest plane in history ever. You know, it's also the coolest plane ever. Um, you know, it had uh, no anti-missile defenses except one, accelerate. Yeah. And zero, they tried to shoot it down many times, zero successes.
just give us a quick sense of what you think this area will look like in, say, 10 years when you are flying crews? Oh, I, th I think it'll be like a, t a, lot, a lot more buildings and a lot more stuff. Um, <laughs> like way, way more stuff than is currently here. Um, as you can tell, the wind is really quite vigorous. The, uh, like one of the things that I think will be quite important to have locally is um, propellant production. So trucking massive, you know, thousands of tons of liquid oxygen to the site doesn't make a ton of sense. We should really produce the, ox the liquid oxygen here. Um, and by the way, it's, we have gaseous oxygen in the atmosphere. So we basically just need electricity. Um, and, oh, I've, I've got to mention, one of the things over time um, is, uh, like for, example, for, for the prop propellant production on Mars, um, will be um, completely uh, renewable um, because we will use solar panels um, pull the CO2 out of the atmosphere, Mars is a primarily CO2 atmosphere, um, get the H2O, the water, from the ice. Mars has a, a, a massive amount of ice. You combine H2O uh, and CO2 and you get CH4 and O2. Um, this is a very uh, long understood process of run it over a ruthenium catalyst. Uh, this is a Sabatier process to create uh, CH4 and O2 out of uh, CO2 and, and H2O. Um, and that same system that we developed for Mars will long term be used on Earth. So long term, this is like, long term we will produce the propellant for the rockets using solar power. Um, and pull the CO2 from Earth's atmosphere, use water, combine that into, into create CH4 and O2 on Earth. Um, and so the long term um, outcome will be quite sustainable and renewable for Earth and Mars. Jeff Faust of Space News. Uh, you spent a lot of time this summer working with the FAA getting approval to do a single star hopper flight yeah. to 150 meters. Now you're talking about flying a much bigger vehicle to much higher altitudes and ultimately flying to orbit. Where are you in the FAA in terms of getting approval for that? And will those flight opportunities be able to coexist with, say, the, the local residents around here? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd say um, the FAA Administrator for Space has been excellent to, uh, to work with. Uh, very forward-leaning, um, um, really, has, I would just like to say thanks to the FAA for their support, actually. Um, I mean, really, there's, you know, I, minimal delays related to regulatory activity, and, and they've been really very reasonable, and so, you know, the support's very much appreciated. Um, so, you know, I think the FAA is, like, asks, uh, you know, good questions and uh, you know, wants to make sure things are safe, as do we. Um, and so we're going to make sure that uh, this, um, the risk to the public is extremely, you know, vanishingly small. Almost nothing, basically. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the same sort of thing that we've had to, that we, that we deal with on Falcon 9 and Dragon. Um, and uh, has gone very well, you know, for the 17 years that SpaceX has been around. So, so you know, I think I feel pretty optimistic about things. Um, I, do, I, don't, I don't see any fundamental uh, obstacles. Um, we, we are working with uh, the, the residents of Boca Chica Village because we think over time it's going to be quite disruptive to, their, to, to, to living in Boca Chica Village because it will end up getting, needing to get cleared for safety a lot of times, so I'd say probably not very, uh, you know, there would be just uh, not very comforting to the Boca Chica Village. It, I mean, I think the actual danger to Boca Chica Village is, is low, but it's not, it's not tiny. So therefore, I mean, we want super tiny risk. So, you know, probably over time, better to um, buy out the, the villages. And, and we've made an offer to that effect, yeah. Thank you, Elon. It's uh, Tarek Malik from Space.com. And I was curious, with the design update here, if a 100-person crew size for base uh, flights is still kind of the target now, and how the life support... Sorry, could you talk about that? The wind is like howling in my ear, unfortunately. Sure. Yes, uh, with the design update here, I'm curious if the 100-person crew size target is still the main target for uh, base crew flights and how the life support system for that is being developed for both the initial test flights and then maybe for Mr. Miyazawa's flight uh, too in upcoming years. Thank you. Yeah, I think you, 
it's really, I, I, I think you could still do 100 people. Um, if it, like the, 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 the pressurized volume on Starship is around 1,000 cubic meters. So if you had 100 people, you'd have 10 cubic meters per person, which is, you know, and, uh, especially in like a zero G situation, that's actually quite a lot of room. Unlike a one G situation, you, you, you only get to use one surface, really, live on one surface in a 1G situation, but in a, in a 0G situation, you can live on, th on six surfaces. You know, you can like all, all six sides of a cube. So um, if things are way roomier um, than uh, they may seem. Um, and, and by the way, 1,000 cubic meters, I think, is close to what the space station pressurized volume is. So this, it's, it, you know, Starship is like, basically like launching space station uh, pressurized volume on every flight. This is quite a lot. We can make, we, we can make it bigger if as needed, you know. Um, yeah. Hi, Elon. Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Uh, thanks for taking our questions. Um, we see the Starship prototype here, Mark 1. You talked a little bit about how you're going to build the super heavy vehicle. Can you update us a little bit more detail about how that development is going, where exactly it'll be built, um, and when we might see it on the on a on a test stand or on a pad? Uh, sure. Yeah. Good question. Um, so the priority is to build at least uh, two starships at each site at Boca at the, and the Cape, um, and then start building the booster. So um, we'll we'll complete um, you know Mach one through four before doing Mach 1 of the booster. And then we'll do um, you know, Mach 1 and Mach 2 of the boosters uh, at, at the Cape and, and, and Boca. The, the main constraint on, on, on launching the booster is, is, um, is engines. Because obviously the booster has a lot of engines. So uh, spooling up the Raptor production rate is extremely important to, uh, and vital, obviously, essential to um, completing the booster. Uh, do, doing the, the, the tanks um, and the legs and say the grid fins, that is not a constraint. Like that we can get done fast. Um, but we need, I think we would want to have at least probably tw 24 engines, but I think really at least 31 engines uh, to launch. So um, can you add that up? You've got a lot of engines there, you know. Uh, we need to, for, for, for four, four starships, we need to, well, the, the, these, these have just have three, Mach 1 and 2 just have three, three Raptor engines. Mach 3 and 4 will have six. So you add them, it's just like a lot of engines, basically. Um, including development engines, um, from now through, through orbit, we probably need 100 Raptor engines. Um, and our production rates right now is maybe one every sort of, Eight to ten days, um, and uh, but it should be one every couple of days in a few months, and then our, our target is to get to a Raptor engine every day by Q1 next year, or, or sooner. And if I may, when, when when will we see people flying on this vehicle into space? Well, I think we could potentially see people fly next year. You know. If, if, we, if we get to orbit in about six months, um, then, and, and we have a, remember, we, this, it's designed to be a reusable rocket, so a reusable booster, re reusable ship, so we can, we can do many flights to prove out the reliability very quickly. So whereas with an expendable vehicle, you have to build, if you want to do 10 flights, let's say, to prove out the viability of an expendable vehicle, you need to build and destroy 10 vehicles, um, whereas, we can do 10 flights you know, it, within basically a 10 days. Um, so when I say rapid reusability, I mean you, know, you, you, you can fly, fly, fly the booster 20 times a day, you fly the ship three or four times a day. That's what I mean by reusability. And the only reason the ship it takes more time than that, is more time than the booster, is that you need a couple of, of you, you need, you know, three or four orbits to synchronize for the ship so that it is uh, over, you know, like 
I don't want to get into those complicated uh, thing of orbital dynamics and the rotation of the Earth relative to satellite. But as, as anyone who's like uh, knows the space, uh, you know, the track of a satellite, unless it's an equatorial satellite, is is a sinusoidal track uh, on on the Earth. It's e unless it's e uh, equatorial or sun synchronous. So. Um, so, it, 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 you know, launching sort of due east, you have to kind of uh, wait for the orbits, to, the, 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 the ground path to sync up with the launch site. And that's the only reason it really takes like, you know, maybe six hours or something like that to sync up and land back at Boca or the Cape. Um, you know, one of the really interesting, interesting things to, to contemplate is the total mass to orbit capability of a large reusable system where you have a significant fleet in operation. Um, the, you know, if, you have, if you've got something like Starship where you've got you know, maybe 150 tons capable to orbit um, and the ship can fly, is, is capable of say theoretically flying um, four times a day, but, but you know, they call it like 75% uptime, so theoretical three times a day uh, 365 days a year, so that's like about a thousand flights a year um, for the ship. The, the booster can do a lot more than that. Um, this is obviously max theoretical, um, and you've got, you know, 150 tons. That's sort of 150,000 tons to orbit per year per ship. Um, and if you've got say 10 ships. Uh, you would have a hundred and you know, one and a half million tons to orbit per year. Um, Twenty ships, you got three million tons orbit a year. I think the total rest of world capacity, if you take all rockets on Earth, including Falcon, the total capacity to orbit, I think, is around two to three hundred tons currently. Total Earth capacity to orbit is about two to three hundred tons. If all rockets launched at max rate. Um, so we're talking about something that is, w w with, with a fleet of starships, a thousand times more than all Earth capacity combined. All, all other rockets combined would be 0.1%, including ours. But you kind of need that if you're going to build a city on Mars. So it's got to be done. It's got to be done. Uh, Elon, hi, it's Bill Harwood with CBS News. I just wanted to follow up on a, an earlier question about life support systems because that's not trivial and obviously you're, you're building a very sophisticated piece of hardware. Are you thinking about closed loop regenerative systems? Are you thinking about developing these in-house or are you looking at designs that already exist on space station, for example? And what are you shooting for initially? I know you're not going to be launching 100 people on your first flight, but what sort of a true complement can we expect on those initial test flights and what, how sophisticated does that life support system need to be? Thanks. Yeah, um, I think for sure you'd want to have a regenerative uh, life support system. Um, so that, that just means you're recycling everything. Um, you know, that's for sure important uh, if you're on a several months journey to Mars and then uh, you're you know, on the surface for 18 months. Um, it's regenerative is a kind of a necessity. Um, so I, I don't think it's actually super hard to do that. Uh, relative to the, the spacecraft itself, the life support system is pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, you just got to take to, you know, to, yeah, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You got to take out the water vapor and the CO2, convert that back to O2. Um, it's not, not super hard. Um, The, the, the early flights of Starship would not have any people on board. It would just be in a, automatic mode. Uh, it would only be later flights that would have people on board. So I think like the even the first flights to Mars, we would, we would send at least a couple of ships, have them just land automatically before sending people. Yeah. Take about two more questions. Uh, hi, Elon. Eric Berger with uh, Ars Technica. Um, I, I would just argue the X-15 was the coolest plane of all time. Um, <laughs> and, and my question, I guess, is, you know, we're not really used to seeing hardware built in less than a year. Can you talk about the timeline for this vehicle? Like, 
when you started fabricating it and how you went so quickly on it. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, actually, I'm not sure. I think like, up until October last year, we were pursuing a completely different design. So it was really, um, I switched the design to steel, I think, yeah, approximately, uh, maybe October last year. Um, and then it's like, okay, let's, what's the fastest we can build a steel, you know, ship in Texas? Uh, and then we got, I think we built it, built it in about four months or something. Um, maybe, maybe five months. Um, and then uh, th th this, the ship, uh, I think we, we, I'm not sure exactly when we started building it, but yeah, probably maybe about four months ago that we started building the ship, maybe five. So it's been four or five months since we started building the ship from nothing, I think. Yeah, something like that. And how did you go so fast? Um, well, I, I have this mantra called, if the schedule's long, it's wrong. If it's tight, it's right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, just uh, basically um, just go rec recursive improvement on schedule. Um, and uh, say, uh, with feedback loop, did this make it go faster? Uh, okay, if it didn't, we're gonna need to fix it. Um, if the design, if the design is, takes a long time to build, it's the wrong design. This is the fundamental thing. Over and over, it's, it's like the tendency is to complicate things. And I have another thing, which is like, the best part is no part. The best process is no process. It weighs nothing, costs nothing, um, can't go wrong. So, as obvious as that sounds, the best, the best part is no part. Like the, my, the, the thing I'm most impressed with in when I have the design meetings at SpaceX is what did you undesign? Undesigning is the best thing. Just delete it. That's the best thing. Yeah. Hey, Elon. Uh, Robin here from supercluster.com. My question is about potential fun synergy between SpaceX and your other projects. One, is there a concept for a Tesla ro Mars rover? Two, are you going to be launching? Yeah, is there a concept already? Uh, well, actually, yes, uh, the Teslas will work on Mars, you know. The, if you can either, a, you can just drive them pretty much. Because um, electric cars don't need uh, oxygen, they don't need air. Uh, so you can just drive them around, no problem. Are you going to bring a boring machine to the moon or Mars? I think that would be a good, good idea. Me too. It, yeah. Because <laughs> you, you could just like, make like, as much room as you want underground. And, and you protect it from radiation and everything. And uh, you could probably use the materials for building. And, and you need to mine ice and dirt anyway. So why not? You know? Totally. Thanks, Elon. And uh, I don't believe you about the aliens. <laughs> I, ho I hope I'm wrong. I mean, I hope they're like... I, well, if they are here, I hope they're nice, you know. Uh, they haven't killed us yet, so they must be not that bad. All right, any other questions? Hi, Elon. I'm Martin Avenue from the uh, SpaceX subreddit. We crowdsourced a few questions. It sounds like I only have time for one, but oh well. Uh, I was wondering, could you uh, elaborate on the number of engines that will be used for the boost back and entry burns on Starship and what the uh, dry landing weight of the Super Heavy will be? Oh yeah, so Starship wouldn't really, if, if, for, the, the, for, there's, there's the 20 kilometer thing, which uh, you know, is mostly, it's gonna have three engines, you know. Um, but you only really need like either three, two of them to work at any given point in time. Um, but but the ship, when it's in orbital operation, will will only need a tiny bit of impulse to deorbit. Like you only, it's, you need like a very tiny, like less than five percent of the mass of the vehicle is needed to deorbit. Um, so you just like really puff one of the engines, um, and the main thing is like trying to get the control. Like how do you shut off the thrust precisely, r really precisely, so that you don't over or undershoot your target, um, and and then uh, so so yeah. Um, for the booster, the booster has seven engines that gimbal, and then the, the rest, whether it's a total of 31 or 37, are fixed. Um, the, the, the fixed engines would not be used for boost back. So the, only the center seven would be used for, for boost back. Um, and then I really want to try to avoid an entry burn, if at all possible, 
That would, because I, 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 that, that would, no, you, you have to have a high, the system has to be capable of, of a very high Q uh, entry in order to avoid um, an entry burn. But I think we might be able to make the booster buff enough that it, you know, it doesn't need an entry burn, ho hopefully. So then it just needs a landing burn. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. All right.